The Dragonback Series by Timothy Zahn. Book Three Dragon and Slave. Chapter Nine. There were two breaks that morning, each one a big, fat five minutes long. Most of the slaves took the opportunity to sit down and stretch tired muscles. Jack, in contrast, worked straight through both. A longer 20-minute break came at noon, accompanied by a cup of what Marilyn called nutrient broth. To Jack, it seemed more like flavored water with delusions of soup hood. But it tasted all right, and he had to admit he felt better after drinking it. He worked through most of that break, too, holding his soup cup with one hand and sipping from it as he picked. It was mid-afternoon, and Fleck had just called another five-minute break when he first heard the music. He paused and looked around. It was a delicate sound, clear and precise and clean. Earthreal, even, if he was remembering that word right. The kind of music that would fit perfectly with a movie scene of a tropical paradise which made its presence in the middle of a slave colony like a sweetly smiling kick in the teeth. Where is that music coming from? Dracos murmured. I don't know, Jack said, straightening up and looking around. And then an old man came into view from around a curve in the bushes. He walked slowly as if his knees were tired or stiff or both, and on his head he wore an amazingly wide-brimmed hat and in his hands he carried a musical instrument like nothing Jack had ever seen before. Jack blinked, wiping the sweat off his forehead. The instrument was mostly metal, that much he could tell from the glints of sunlight off its surface. Sections of it looked familiar, too, as if the old man had put it together from pieces of a half dozen other instruments. The part he was blowing into seemed to have come from a flute, but there were also valves from a trumpet and possibly a tuba. The other parts Jack didn't recognize at all. He glanced around. The only other slave nearby was Lisa, leaning half into her bush as she strained to reach some berry deep inside the tangle of branches. Hey, Lisa, Jack said, stepping over to her. What's with the musician? She made a sound like a horse snorting. It's the klezmer. What's a klezmer? I look like an encyclopedia to you. She snorted. That's just what he calls himself. Okay, okay, Jack said soothingly. I was just asking. And I was just telling, Lisa said sourly. Probably means leech in some human language. Jack frowned. Leech? Lisa snorted again. Take another look. Jack turned back. The klezmer was walking slowly along the line of berry pickers now. Each of the working slaves turned toward him as he passed. And to Jack's surprise, each dropped some berries into the container looped around the klezmer's neck. Okay, I give up, Jack said. What are they doing? Like I said, he's a leech, Lisa growled. Story goes, his eyes have gone too bad for him to pick berries. My eyes so cry over him. But don't the Brumgas have some kind of... Jack floundered. What? Retirement plan? Lisa asked scornfully. Don't be ridiculous. We don't work, we don't eat. Period. She shrugged in the klezmer's direction, the thick scales of her shoulder scratching against the branches from the movements. So he's got this scam going. He plays music and pretends he's not begging, and everyone else gives him berries and pretends it's not charity. Jack studied her right ear, about all of her face he could see through the branches and leaves. There had been an odd emphasis on the last word. You don't believe in charity? Reluctantly, he thought, she pulled back from the bush and turned those dark eyes on him. Are you that naive? She asked bitterly. Or are you just stupid? We're slaves. Slaves! The bottom of the bottom of the stack. Charity is for people who have something extra to give. Not us. Here, no one looks out for you but yourself. What about Marilyn? Jack asked. She seems to me seems to me like she's trying to look out for us. Oh, right, Lisa countered. Marilyn, she helped Noy's parents, too. They both ended up dead. She helped Greb and Grib's uncle. He wound up dead, too. Her eyes flicked over Jack's shoulders. 
And let's see what good all her good intentions do for anyone now. Jack turned around. Coming up behind the klezmer was another of the open-topped cars like the ones they'd used to bring him to the slave colony. Inside, he could see two brumgas, one an adult male, the other much smaller and younger. The car coasted to a stop, and both of them got out. Quick! Look busy! Lisa warned, sticking her face back into the bushes. Jack took a long step to the next bush over and got back to work, watching the two brumgas out of the corner of his eye. They began walking slowly along the line of working slaves, the younger one jabbering to the older. And suddenly, the air seemed full of tension. What is it? Jack murmured toward Lisa. The klezmer, he noted, had stopped playing and was standing off to the side, stiff and silent. An inspection? Worse, Lisa hissed from inside her bush. Cram Patch's spoiled brat of a daughter is back for a new toy. Jack frowned. A toy? The two Brumgas kept walking, the younger one pointing here and there and making questioning noises, the older one answering her back. Lisa was right, Jack realized. It was exactly like she was a kid in a toy shop. A kid trying to talk her father into buying her one of everything. And then the daughter stopped suddenly, her jabbing finger becoming insistent. Her father answered. She pointed all the more violently. He shrugged and said something. And from the line of bushes stepped one of Lisa's fellow dolems. The older Brumga gestured, and taking his daughter's arm, he turned back toward the car. Setting his collection bowl carefully onto the ground, the dolem followed. Behind him, Lisa hissed something vicious-sounding. May her body swell up and burst, she mur murmured. What's she going to do with him? Jack asked. Probably paint him, Lisa said, biting out each word like it was a piece of bad-tasting gristle. That's what she usually does when she takes dolems. She thinks our scales look like a paint-by-number mosaic just waiting for her to decorate. May she and her family be cursed forever. She made a deep rumbling noise that seemed to echo in her chest and throat. Or maybe she'll decide to try carving designs in him again. She did that once. Jack winced. Sounds painful. It is if you get too deep, Lisa said. She did. After she got bored and sent him back, like she always does, he got sick from infections in the cuts. It took him six days to die. Nice kid. Jack muttered, hunching his shoulders. Dracos was sliding restlessly along his skin, and he could practically feel the dragon's anger. He didn't blame him. If things like this were why the Kadah hated slavery so much, he was ready to join the club himself. What about this one? he asked. Do you know him? It was a stupid question, he realized too late. Of course she would know all the other dolems among the slaves. But her answer surprised him. Not really! She said, I think his name's Placit or Plusit, something like that. Jack frowned at her, but the thick tile pattern of her face as she stared at the Brumgas was unreadable. You don't know? He asked. I mean, he's one of your people. Her eyes shifted back to Jack. What was your name again? She asked pointedly. Just as pointedly, she turned her wide back to him and went back to her work. Right, Jack muttered. The message was clear. Lisa didn't want to know any of them. They were slaves, and she was a slave, and the only place to hide from that reality was inside herself. And so that was where she would stay. The Brumgas and the Dolem drove away, and for a moment there was silence. Then the Klezmer resumed his music, and the slaves returned to their picking. Later, when the Klezmer came by, Jack put a handful of berries into his bowl. The old man murmured some thanks, and on a sudden impulse, Jack put in a second handful. For a long time afterwards, he wondered why he'd done that. It had probably surprised him more than it had the klezmer, especially considering his own dinner, or lack of it, was on the line. Perhaps it was his reaction to Lisa's selfish attitude that had sparked such unusual generosity. Or maybe it was just knowing that Dracos was watching. Dracos and his blasted pain-in-the-neck Kadah warrior ethic. He did notice that when the klezmer went past Lisa, she ignored him completely. As it turned out, his generosity didn't end up costing him anything after all. 
By the time the Brumgas set up their tables, he had filled his bowl to the line. In fact, he continued past the line and loaded berries all the way to the very top. He turned in his bowl, collected his meal ticket, and joined the line of slaves heading to dinner. The meal hall looked about the way Jack had expected. Long tables with plain wooden benches on both sides. The meal itself was actually better than he'd expected. It consisted of another of the cabbage rolls he'd had the night before, plus a bowl of the nutrient soup they'd been given at noon, plus a piece of multigrain bread of some kind, plus a small slab of real meat. The cabbage roll didn't taste quite as good as it had when he'd been starving, but it tasted good enough. He drank the soup, too, wiping the bowl with his bread to make sure he got every drop. The meat went quietly into a pocket to give to Dracos later. When the meal was over, each slave cleaned his utensils at a long tub of water and returned them to the cooking slaves. After that, Jack's plan had been to take a quick, quiet walk off by himself where he and Dracos could talk without being overheard. But during the meal, he'd found his muscles tightening up from the strain of the day's work. Some of them were muscles he hadn't even known he had. By the time he hobbled out of the meal hall on stiff legs, the thought of doing anything but going straight to bed was long gone. He changed into his sack shirt, laying out his other clothing neatly over the end of his cot. Marilyn came by once to see how he was doing and left again after he assured her he was fine. She didn't offer to wash his clothes this time. That was probably something he would have to do on his own from now on. Tomorrow, when he wasn't so tired, he would ask someone how he went about doing that. He forced himself to stay awake for a few minutes after the lights went out, hoping that everyone else in the hut would get to sleep quickly. Dracos, he whispered when he judged he'd waited long enough. They are all asleep, the dragon confirmed softly. Are you all right? I'm pretty tired, Jack admitted, sliding the meat out from under his pillow where he'd hidden it. Otherwise, I'm okay. Got some food for you here. Sorry, it's not more. It is quite adequate, Dracos assured him. His head rose up from Jack's chest, his crest pushing up the thin blanket. I am not very hungry. Yeah, Jack said, watching as the dragon wolfed down the meat in a single bite. Right. Truly, Dracos insisted. You should sleep now. No argument there, Jack agreed. You going back to the thorn hedge? Yes, Dracos said. His head flattened again into Jack's chest, and Jack felt him slithering along onto his right arm. He picked up the cue and turned onto his left side, draping the arm over the cot toward the floor. The dragon slid off his wrist, landing on the wooden floor without a sound. See you later, Jack whispered. Don't get caught. I will be careful, Draco said. Good, Jack snorted gently. I was just thinking. Remember back at the Winyard's Edge Recruiting Center when Jommy Randolph made that snide comment about the training being like summer camp? I remember, Draco said. And? Jack made a face in the dark. Compared to this, he said, it was. Dracos brushed Jack's arm with his forepaw. Good night, Jack, he said. I will return soon.